Hi, I'm Lynn Cornell, and welcome to Journey Through the Bible Verse by Verse. Grab your Bibles and follow along as we study through each book of the Bible, verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Now, I'm using the Holman Christian Standard Bible, so if you're reading from a different Bible translation, the read is different, but the message is the same. And we're going to continue in our study through the Gospel of Mark, and we're in chapter 2. So verse 1 says, when he entered Capernaum again after some time, it was reported that he was at home. Now, home is his um, Capernaum, not to be confused with his hometown of Nazareth. Jesus grew up in Nazareth, and at 30, he left Nazareth and settled in the city of Capernaum. Um, verse 2, so many people gathered together that, were, that there was no more room, not even in the doorway. And he was speaking the message to them. Now, them refers to the lawyers and the scribes and the Pharisees. They had traveled up from Galilee. Their purpose was to try to trap Jesus. They wanted to um, find some way to get rid of him. And so really, this is a minister's meeting. That's who's there. That's who's crowded in this room. Um, Mark, I mean, Luke points out that the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And that's amazing when you see what unfolds here. Now, verse 3, then they came to him bringing a paralytic carried by four men. Since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowds, they removed the roof above where he was. And when they had broken up, broken through, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, When he says he saw their faith, and remember, Mark is a verb. This whole book is action, one action after another. And so, actually, so when when they couldn't bring the man in, and they actually, when Jesus is seeing how determined that they were, <laughs> uh, that they actually tore up a man's roof, he said, that's faith. The response is even more interesting because... He says, your sins are forgiven you. Now, obviously, they didn't tear the man's roof up to have their sins forgiven. They tore the man's roof up so that he could be healed. But the question is this. Think about this. Which was the more beneficial to the man? Let's say if he did not get healed, wouldn't the more beneficial thing that would have happened to him is that his sins would have been forgiven? Number six. But some of the scribes were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? By the way, Jesus understood in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves and said to them, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your mat, and walk, but that you may know. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, I tell you, get, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. Immediately he got up, picked up his mat, and went out in front of everyone. And as a result, they were all astonished and gave glory to God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. And so he sort of challenges down the Pharisees. He, he, he makes a very... Um, profound statement without saying it. The question was, and it was a good question, who can forgive sin? Now, he answers their question. Who can forgive sins except God only? So he answered it. Right? He, he knows what they're thinking. So he, he says to them, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or pick up your mat and walk? From a human standpoint, and if you only wanted to regulate Jesus to just a mere man, from a human standpoint, either one was impossible. So when Jesus heals the man, what does he do? He validates the statement, your sins are forgiven. He validates the fact that he has authority to forgive sins, thus answering the Pharisees' questions. Who can forgive sins but God only? Jesus then declares without saying it, that he's God. 
which is interesting because if he had said he was God, then the Pharisees would have got up and arrested him. <laughs> okay. Now, verse 13, then Jesus went out again besides the sea and the whole crowd was coming to him and he taught them. Then moving on, he saw Levi, <clears throat> the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax, tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he got up and followed him. Now, Levi is Matthew, of course, uh, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew. And tax, he was a tax collector. Now, tax collectors were hated by the Jewish people. They were considered as traitors because they worked for the Roman government collecting taxes. And so, of course, they were seen as, again, um, being a part of the oppression, uh, uh, the arm of oppression from the Roman government. OK. And what the, what the tax collectors would do is they would pay the taxes up front and then they would turn around and then overcharge the people to recoup their losses and make a profit. And there was no nothing you could do about it. There was no recourse. So when Jesus says to follow him that's very interesting that you see <laughs> this very odd six out of the um, apostles were devout people this man was a loose and immoral person and we'll see this in a moment verse 15 while he was reclining at the table in Levi's house many tax collectors and sinners were also guests with Jesus and his disciples because there were many who were following him. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard this, he told them, those who are well don't need a doctor, but the sick do need one. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. And so he kind of answers their question by saying, my purpose for being here is for them. And by, of course, being a manifestation of God's love and grace, he's extending that to these very people. Now, sinners in this day were these immoral people. They were the flagrant people. Boisterous, unruly. They openly flaunted their immorality. You know, <clears throat> adultery, fornications. They were loud, right? <coughs> they openly caroused and stuff. There was no discretion about them. And here Jesus is eating with each group of people. And of course, the Pharisees, thinking they were holy, because they had an exterior appearance of piety. And really, they were no better, by the way. Remember, these were the same people who were plot to kill, to lie and frame Jesus. Okay. Uh, verse 17. Now, uh, when, uh, verse 18. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and asked him, why do John's disciples and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot fast while the groom is with them, can they? As long as they have the groom with them, they cannot fast. But the time will come when the groom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new patch pulls away from the old cloth, and the worst tear is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskin. Otherwise, the wineskins will burst, and the skins of the wine is lost as well as the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skin. Uh, wine skin. So um, what is amazing about this is that already John, who's just shortly been off the scene, is there is a religion already forming around John's teachings and practices. Notice John's disciples. Um, were fasting. Now, that's also interesting that notice it says that John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. So that it's interesting that John's disciples were gravitating towards the Pharisees as opposed to the one John pointed to. If you remember, John pointed to Jesus and said, this is the Lamb of God. This is the one who was supposed to, the, the, the chosen one to come. And so it's interesting that his disciples are not following the one whom they're their teacher 
had pointed out to them. So already you see this religion forming, these traditions and stuff. And so Jesus basically simply says, with a simple answer, is that, hey, new wine for new wine skin. Obviously, today we have bottles, so we, they don't use wine skins again. The, the analogy is that, okay, new, um, oh, the new, what is new uh, versus the old, the old covenant, the New Testament versus the old covenant. Um, verse 23, on the Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields and his disciples began to make their way, picking some heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, look, why are you, why are they doing that? Which is not lawful on the Sabbath. And he said to them, have you never read what David and those who were with him did when he was in need and in hungry, how he entered the house of God at the time of Abiathar, Abi, I don't know why I messed this thing up. Um, Abathar. Um, I'm going to say this one more time. Abathar, <laughs> the high priest, and ate the sacred bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest, and also gave some to his companions. And then he told them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, we're going to see these conflicts that the, the Pharisees are, are constantly accusing Jesus of breaking the Sabbath day law. And he is not breaking the law at all. But what he is breaking is their interpretations of the law. And man... Uh, and, and so there are traditions that were formed around that, around the law. They, 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 you start off with the law, and then, you, then you, you, you have these traditions and these interpretations of the law. And so um, in time, the Pharisee, what the Pharisees were preaching and practicing were their interpretations and their um, traditions. So when they said, you're not doing what is lawful. Now, the idea of work, what the Sabbath day command was, you shouldn't do any work. What the law did provide for, that if you're walking down the, you know, you're walking down the road and you're hungry, you see a field, that you can go and you could take some, in this case, these grains of corn. And these grains of corn, they wasn't stalks and ears like we know, actually corn, and I, how we use the term. But they're more like grain. And they would take this grain, they would rub it in their hands, and they would eat from the grain. Now, the, the law provided that you could eat until you were filled. Now, you could not take, you could not pack anything, you couldn't gather. But you can just eat until you were filled, and then you would go on. And the law more so was designed for the poor, but also if you were just traveling. You, like I said, you could, the only thing is you couldn't hoard. Now, obviously, you couldn't, um, if you were... Um, Picking corn on the Sabbath day or picking apples or whatever to bake a pie, that would have been a violation because you're doing work. So Jesus wasn't um, Jesus wasn't violating the law. And then he quotes even this point where David in his travels and when he was on the run from Saul, that he went into the um, priest's house, um, Abathar. Um, Abiathar, I, I don't know why I keep messing up that name, okay. Um, but anyway, the, this high priest, how um, this, this high priest gave him the holy bread. And then Jesus makes this statement, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And this captures, by the way, the essence of the, the, the what religion is versus what the heart of God is, or God's really true commands. That religion thinks that they are to serve the commandments. And notice Jesus makes this statement here that the Sabbath was made for man, which it basically is. It was a day of rest. But this, the, the Pharisees made it, uh, and they would make these ridiculous interpretations, but they made a, um, uh, they made it to be where you were enslaved to these commandments. And that's what Jesus rebuked. All right, we're going to pick it up with chapter 3 next time, so I'll see you then.